Hello people and welcome to the History of Sexuality Volume 4 course, The Confessions of the Flesh. This first class is free on the channel and in the coming weeks I will publish the following classes on my website only. For those who want to purchase the entire course you can go to the website or if you prefer you can become a Patreon on, on, of the channel and thereby have access to all courses including volumes 2 and 3 that are already recorded. It's important to know volumes 2 and 3 to better understand volume 4 of the history of sexuality. Foucault showed in volumes 2 and 3 what a pagan society of doctors and philosophers looked like in Greece that created a whole regime of aphrodisia, a regime that was not meant to be followed by everyone, which was directed mainly at those free men who could come to rule the city. Caring of the self was not a set of universal codes of conduct to be followed by everyone. It was expected of those who had government of their families, of household properties, and that eventually would also govern the city. What we will see in this passage from a pagan culture, a Greek and Roman culture, where the principles of a good life were sought from the philosophers and doctors, where they sought to learn about the regime of aphrodisia with diets, physical exercises, regimes of pleasure, and to a nascent Christian culture are changes in the techniques of self that will be used, as well as changes in relation to the whole understanding of the subject and of the world. In the early centuries of Christianity, Christian priests and theologians will bring from the pagan source many ideas about the function of marriage, the role of sexual relations in the, in the ancient philosophers like Plato and also in Stoicism. These early priests and theologians will try to defend Christianity in part by saying that it puts into practice the same principles that philosophers advocated. It was important for these early priests and theologians to say that they affirmed, for example, the same as the Stoics about the function of marriage being procreation, as well as about the importance of the dominion over oneself, of the desire of oneself. The mistrust of pleasure, the mastery over oneself, of oneself over oneself, in matters of pleasure, will be references used by the first Christian thinkers to defend the universality of Christianity. It's clear that this universality was also presumed for Stoicism and for Plato. Says Foucault, citation, Athenagoras does not use these themes to indicate distinctive features of Christianity as opposed to paganism. It's about showing how Christians escape the accusations of immorality that are addressed and how their life is the very realization of the same ideal of morality which, in turn, the wisdom of the pagans recognized. At most, Athenagoras underlines the fact that the beliefs of Christians in eternal life and the desire to join God constitute for them a deep and solid reason to really follow such precepts. Even better, to keep intentions pure and to expel from themselves even those thoughts of the actions they condemn. End of citation. So, let's see. These early priests and theologians sought to speak in a language accepted by the thinkers of their time. Athenagoras tried to convince the Stoic Roman Emperor Marcus Aurelius about how Christianity would be imbued with the same morality as Stoicism. But for Christians, following a moral of an upright life was intended to unite one with God in, it, in eternal life. God for them was elsewhere in the beyond. For Stoics like 
Marcus Aurelius. Everything is here and now. And learning to live a better life was to live and not to reach a life in the hereafter. Athenagoras was a Christian apologist. Apologists are those uh, that defend Christianity against objections. Michel Foucault, in the first chapter of the book History of Sexuality, Volume 4, The Confessions of the Flesh, this chapter entitled Creation, Procreation, focuses on the writings of Clement of Alexandria. Clement was also an apologist and theologian, a Greek born in Athens in the second century of the Christian era. He argued, very much in line with ancient philosophy, that marriage and sex were not bad in themselves. A big difference that appears in Clement is that the precepts and principles that he will discuss are considered universally valid and applicable to all. Although Clement speaks as much about the merits of married life as about the merits, merits of life in chastity, he will seek to speak of precepts who, which are generally valid for all, who are married or who are chaste. And here we already have a difference in relation to the old philosophies, because in them the care of oneself was not desired as a universally valid rule for everyone. In ancient philosophy, care was taken to ensure that each person occupies the world differently according to their social position and according to the dominion over oneself they were able to exercise. In the book The Pedagogue, Clement understands the Logos of the ancients as God. For the Stoics, Logos is the principle that animates the universe and is the good in itself. So for Clement, the placing of the Christian God as Logos was a means of placing Christianity as the most fundamental truth of philosophy. Says Foucault, citation, The pedagogue is therefore Christ himself, and what he teaches, or more exactly, what teaches through him, and what he teaches is the Logos. As the verb, it teaches the law of God and the commandments it formulates are living and universal reason." End of citation. The book is therefore the verb itself, the Logos, Christ himself, which manifests there. Clement then places the Logos as constituted of divine maxims, of spiritual universal commandments. We would have these maxims that guide our actions in life here on earth and others that direct actions in the life in the beyond, in the hereafter. And the objectives of following these maxims here on earth would be to be in accordance with the Logos and thus be on the path of eternal life with God after death. We see then that we have here universal maxims of conduct for everyone to follow, which are given by the Logos, they are the Logos. Different from the Stoics, that while he, the, the Stoic li lives his life day to day, meditates on his actions and the results of those actions, to then derive his precepts from this, in this new Christian morality, the precepts are already given in advance by the Logos. The Logos is here the will united to God and Christ and the correct action in life is an action in accordance with the Logos and at the same time leads to eternal life. The virtuous life for this early Christianity will be di very different from the virtuous life of the ancients or of the Stoics. The purpose of this virtuous life is no longer the dominion of oneself over oneself which aims at a good government of the city as it was for the ancient Greece. The virtuous life is now codified in the Logos that is both the principle of straight action and the movement of salvation. The reason of the real world 
and the word of God that calls to eternity. End of citation. So let's see then that there is a du duplicity of action for Clement. It's necessary to be in accordance with the Logos, with straight action in the world, at the same time that this must be the production of the movement that leads to the salvation of the soul. In this straight action in the world, Clement is borrowing from the pagan moralistic sources, mainly from the Stoics, among them Musonius Rufus. Then he will bring from these sources, for example, maxims about the principle that the legitimate union in marriage must desire procreation, on the principle that the pursuit of pleasure alone, even within marriage, is contrary to reason, on the principle that women should be spared any indecent form of relationships, on the principle that when one is ashamed of an action, it is a fault. End of citation. Many of these principles come from before Greek or Roman Stoicism. We can see many of them even in ancient philosophy. Clement broadly quotes Plato, who is of all ancient philosophers the most cited in Christian history. Clement will base Christian moral precepts and prescriptions by a triple determination, says Michel Foucault. The first one, by nature, when quoting doctors and naturalists, showing that the Logos is the principle of organization of the world, which manifests the universal rationality of nature. Secondly, by the philosophers, mainly through Plato, considered by the theologians, the philosopher par excellence, and that also shows the way for human reason to be able to recognize the Logos and the universal precepts, showing that the Logos inhabits the soul of every man. And thirdly, by the Christian scriptures, which show that God explicitly gave man such commandments, and that if man obey, they will join him in will while living life on earth and after, after death in eternal life. Michel Foucault says, citation, but Clement's whole effort is to insert these known and current aphorisms into the complex fabric of quotations, references, or examples that make them appear as prescriptions of the Logos, which is enunciated in nature and human reason or in the word of God. End of citation. Then see that Clement uses prescriptions of knowledge uh, from ancient or from his own contemporary morality in a network of relations with Christian precepts in which he makes everything appear as being tied up. Nature, human reason, and the word of God would be these enunciations of the universal logos. The right morality and the right way to live would be inscribed beforehand in nature, in human reason, and in those who are real philosophers, and in the word of God passed on in the scriptures. The task of the subject here then would only be to align himself with these divine maxims, with these moral precepts universally given for all to follow. And here again, there is a radical difference in relation to all the ancient philosophy that Clement himself seeks in part to affirm. The pedagogue has a regime framework taking loans even from the canonical framework of the Hippocratic regimes of aphrodisia. How and when to exercise, how and when to eat food or drinks, how to take care of sleep, and of sexual relations. Then he borrows all that tradition of sophrosine, the moderation of temperance of the ancients, of practice without excess, which also involved kairos, the opportune moment for carrying out certain activities. 
to sync both the dosage and the time for certain activities within that regime. But these regime prescriptions take on another dimension with this understanding of the Logos that speaks through nature, through universal reason, and through the order of the world as fixed by the Creator. So you have some animals that act against nature, that is, against the rules of nature, and these are the bad examples, and Clement will point to other animals that will be taken as examples of the right way to act, of the Logos. The end of all of this would be to recognize in the examples deposited in nature, and at the same time to seek in reason that is master of itself, and to seek in the lessons given by the Creator, that is, in nature, reason, and in the scriptures, to seek an existence similar to God. All the precepts of life would already be given in nature, but only in nature when it is acting through the Logos. So he will seek, for example, rules that animals respect in relation to the correct way of relating to the other sex, to the spouse, in the correct way and the right time to use the pleasures, and so on. For example, about marriage, Clement will say that, citation, You should not treat your wife as a lover or dispense the seed or semen at random, but rather observe the principles of sobriety, rules that the animals themselves respect. It is a bond that must not be broken, and if it is, you should renounce another marriage while your spouse is still living. Adultery, at last, is banned and must be punished. End of citation. So Clement used several examples taken from the nature of the relationships observed between animal couples, choosing those that represent the Logos, the true will of God, and others that would be against nature. Furthermore, he seeks these precepts in the sobriety of reason, from the one who is master of himself, from the moderate or temperate one who has dominion over his pleasures. And he is still going to look to scriptures too, of course. Foucault marks the novelty brought by Clement, in the relationship between marriage and the regime of sex, sex and sexual relations. Says Foucault, citation, Without a doubt, this is not the first time that we have tried to define what kind of sexual conduct spouses should have. But it is, it seems, the first time that we have developed a whole regime of sexual acts that is not established so much because of individual wisdom and health, but above all from the point of view of the intrinsic rules of marriage. There was a regime of sex and a morality of marriage. That they overlapped, it is quite evident. But in this text by Clement, we have a new combination of the two points of view. What goes on between spouses and which antiquity moralist treated, if only for short notice, at least briefly and from a long distance. They were content to indicate rules of decency and prudence. It is in the process of becoming the object of concern, intervention and analysis. So let's see, Foucault is alluding to antiquity where sex was scarcely talked about. There were few restrictions or prescriptions for sex and sex was not expected to happen only within marriage, with a few exceptions like Plato, for example. Now, sex and marriage will suffer a fundamental connection and will become the object of widespread concern with strong codes in later Christianity. The pedagogue will appear, Michel Foucault says, as the first example of a genre or even a practice that will have considerable importance in the history of Western societies. The examination and analysis of sexual relations between spouses. End of citation. 
But Clement does this in a way that is different from that of later Christianity. In him, we still see this integration of the code of Hellenistic philosophies, of the regimes, of the religious conception of nature, of the logos and all of salvation, all intertwined. Although Clement does not use the term aphrodisia, he is in dialogue with all this ancient tradition. For Clement, the objective of sexual intercourse would be in procreation. And procreation is a means by which following the correct prescriptions means following a certain regime of conduct, allows procreation to happen and that in this way man collaborates in the birth of man. Man then participates in reproduction, in procreation, in the Logos, participates in God the Creator. Man will not breed because of himself or because of the city, as it was for the ancients, but because of God the Creator. What matters to Clement is the principle that runs through all actions, all the time, and this principle is given by God, the Logos. Multiply, as a commandment of the scriptures, is a way for man to reach the likeness of God, and that likeness is achieved not by body only, but by spirit and reasoning as well. It's by obedience to the pedagogy of the Logos, by the observance of the commandments that God prescribed through nature, through the body and the rules of human reason and through the teachings of the philosophers and through the words of the scriptures, then through that triple determination that man can be in synergy with God. Says Foucault, citation, subordinate to the target of making children and then, in addition, to a purpose that joins that of the entire creation Sexual relations must submit to a reason, to a logos, which, present in the whole of nature and even in, the, in its material organization, is also the word of God. End of citation. Within nature, Clement will look for examples that justify sexual relations in general in nature, uh, that have the function of procreation and will call those sexual activities that have no function for pr procreation contra nature, against nature. So if in antiquity we had sexual relations as natural and we had, we had the quest for pleasure problematized but not only centered on procreation, here besides procreation being placed as the only purpose of sexual relations in the case of humans, Marriage will be the only space legitimate for sexual relations and these will be endowed with the whole regime of moderation, sophrosine in Greek, and of opportune moment, kairos in Greek. For Clement, even the logos that Moses transmitted can be observed in nature. Nature would have objectionable animals showing that all access can lead away from the Logos, that is, out of the good. And ancient philosophers also made considerations about nature to seek precepts for the use of aphrodisia. But for those philosophers, the main understanding about nature was about man as being endowed with reason and as being social. The man had to have children so that when he was old he could take these children could take care of him he had to have a family to have a certain status he had an obligation to the city to the state and humanity now clement looked at nature as having signs of the logos signs of the commandments that man must follow as universal beings of the logos not as social beings, says Foucault, citation. The philosophers who nevertheless wanted to put aphrodisia on the law of nature and never tried to put aside what was a counter nature, never put their analysis under the sign of nature to such an extent. 
understood as that which naturalists read in the animal world. End of citation. So let's see, in antiquity and even among the Stoics, the understanding of Logos as nature was not one in which the behavior of animals was sought as signs of universal commandments of life. This is a novelty in Clement. For the Stoics, for example, nature is the Logos, but it is accessible while the human being is able to access it because of his universal reason and not because of his animal behavior. Clement then affirms the positive desire for procreation as part of the Logos and negates all waste of semen as counter to nature. Says Foucault, citation. It is not that it is a question of opposing the human order to that of nature, but rather showing how nature manifests itself. And here Foucault quotes Clement, who says, Our whole life can be spent observing the laws of nature if we dominate our desires. End of citation. So see that for Clement, nature has a reason that presides over it, the Logos, but only moderate conduct and temperate conduct is in line with this Logos. So during menstruation or pregnancy, for example, sexual intercourse should be avoided because the Logos has already defined this through the closing of the uterus during pregnancy, for example. The moderate behavior refers to the ancient philosophers who prescribed not to be carried away by the impulses of the body without the control of reason. There was a need here for the soul to prevail over the body, but the ultimate end of Clement's temperate marriage would be alignment with the Creator himself, who through the temperate marriage manages to procreate in the most appropriate way, that is, in the way given by the Logos. Clement also raises the question of sins, of conscience, but these are not yet the same ones that will commit the sinner of our later Christianity. It's not yet the sin of the flesh. With Clement, the sin of the shadow or the conscience is everything that refers to the non-public character of a sin, which could be inside of a private room, for example. Conscience works as an accuser and as a judge. The task of the moderate subject is to align himself with the Logos, which is incorruptible. And for Clement, the body is also part of the Logos. And even when that body is contaminated, it can still be recovered and become even a purified flesh in the future. There was no dualism between body and reason here. The Logos also crosses the body as it crosses the whole of nature. The body was the temple of Christ. Clement is not yet working with the constant vigilance of all small thoughts and desires that can form in the heart as Christianity will do later. There was no need for an absolute renunciation of the self or of the flesh. It was enough to be faithful to the Logos, for it to be possible to fulfill the task of making children in alignment with God. Sexual relations themselves were not a sin, but there were rules to be followed so that these sexual relations could take place in a way that befits God, that is, at the appropriate time, or kairos, and in a moderate way, that is, following the precepts of alignment with nature, with reason and with God. Clement's story shows that there has never been a single Christian sexual morality, that this morality was born already multiple in its origins, already contaminated by pagan philosophies, and that it has changed over time. Clement still leads us to a consideration of nature as aligned with God, the most fundamental truth then. He still does not consider human nature as totally defined by the fall, as totally negative. Through it, we still hear a certain positive experience of what we today call nature. 
he still did not super signify sexual relations in order to deny them completely or in order to overvalue absolute virginity and chastity, as happened in later Christianity, that we will talk about in the next chapters of the book. Clement refers to a type of experience, to a way of producing the subject, and to an ethics that are very different from later Christianity. Because it's not about a continuity in relation to what he proposed, the history of Christian morality is not a reinforcement of codes that were already present in Clement. It's a whole other experience that will emerge later. Because if, for Clement, the alignment with God, with the truth of the Logos, occurs in alignment with nature, observing the signs of the Logos in nature, for later Christianity it's in an inner relationship of the subject with his internal truths, with his most intimate desires and thoughts, that the subject's experience will be given by the new technologies of the self that will be created. Michel Foucault is leading us to a genealogy of the subject of desire in Western societies. Well, people, that's all for this class. See you in our next class on chapter 2 of the book, entitled Laborious Baptism. Happy reading and see you then.